Now this evening we're um, going to be looking at essentially what we saw this morning, but I thought I'd start off with a different text. Um, and by the way, I mean not, not what we looked at this morning, the same thing, but from the same text that we were looking at this morning, which I've already read you the portion that touches on that in John chapter 7, verse 18. But I'd like to read for you this evening uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Now this comes from the Sermon on the Mount, which as you know is full of instruction. But this particular uh, portion here is where our Lord is showing us how to know the difference between uh, false prophets and uh, true prophets, particularly how to recognize the false ones. But this is what he says. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every tree, every good tree, bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by the fruits. Now, obviously, with the, um, the number of false teachers we have in the world today, the people on television, megalomaniacs and so forth, it's, it's good for us to be reminded how to distinguish one who is truly of the Lord versus one who is not. And by the way, I, I should just point out as, as I was reading this text, I was remembering uh, another situation where this text was being taught and uh, it was taken in, in an absolute way and I just wanted to mention, I don't think our Lord Jesus when he says that a good tree cannot produce bad fruit nor can a bad tree produce good fruit, that he means absolutely. He does in the case of the bad tree but not in the case of the good tree because if it were true that a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, then I think all of us would call into question immediately whether or not we're saved because every believer sins. So I think what he's saying here, this is the pattern of our lives. If we're a good tree, we'll produce good fruit. That'll be the pattern of our lives. And if we're a bad tree, we'll produce bad fruit. That will be the pattern of our lives. Now again, I just remind you what we saw this morning, that Jesus is the teacher that God has sent from heaven. and we also saw how it is we can know that this is true. And that test was if we are willing to do His will. If by the Spirit of God you are willing to submit to the Word of God, to believe what it says, to do what He tells you to do, Jesus says you will know that this teaching actually comes from Him and that His teaching is divine, that He is declaring the Father's will. Now he says that you'll know this not only by experiencing, experiencing it yourself in your own life. Remember David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you, if you actually do that, if you come to him, if you trust him, you'll experience that for yourself. You'll not only uh, have that experience to prove that it's true, but the Spirit himself who gives you the ability to believe and to submit will himself also bear witness to that truth. He will convince you that what Jesus says is from God, even as we saw with regard to the two on the road to Emmaus. As Jesus was speaking to them and they reflect upon what he says later, did our hearts not burn while he was speaking to us from the scriptures? The Spirit bearing witness with what they were hearing that it was the Word of God. Now, the Spirit's not always going to make us burn inside. We need to recognize that. But we will also recognize that He will distinguish God's Word from the opinions and the writings of men. Now, the Spirit of God will bear witness to all of Scripture, not just portions of it. He will bear witness to the Old Testament because He is the one who inspired it. And He will bear witness also to the New Testament. Remember that it's not, you know, Jesus wasn't speaking just when he was on earth. Jesus was speaking long before he came into the world through his spirit to the Old Testament prophets. 
And after Jesus left this world and ascended into heaven, he continued to speak through the New Testament prophets and apostles. That his revelation, of course, might be complete. The Spirit of God is going to bear witness to the entirety of God's Word and more directly to our point this evening, he's going to bear witness to that word as it is taught today. We do know the prophets, the apostles completed their work even as our Lord Jesus Christ completed his work and they have gone into heaven. But the Lord is continuing his teaching ministry today through those he has called to this work. And because the Lord Jesus continues to teach, the Spirit of God continues to bear witness to his word as it continues to come through those the Lord has appointed. Now this is one of the ways we can know that it is the word of God uh, by the fact the Spirit of God bears witness to it. I do want us though to look at uh, another way and really I think it's the same thing. By the fruit that it produces, whether it's uh, consistent with the word of God and whether it produces that which is consistent with the Word of God. Now again, it's important for us to understand this because of the age in which we live. I mean, we live in an age of celebrities. I think, you know, we've been reminded of that again and again. Uh, everyone around us seems to be seeking fame through whatever avenue they might be able to, uh, through acting, through singing, through sports, and of course we've been reminded lately through politics. Everybody wants to be president. And so we have a number of people seeking those nominations. Well, sadly, what's going on in, in these different areas of the world is also permeated the church. We are a celebrity-driven church, which is also why we need to be careful uh, whom we listen to, because there are those who reach this status who are true uh, because of God's mercy and grace and His blessing on their ministry, but there are also those who are false, and we need to be able to tell the difference. So how do we tell the difference? Uh, should we do what others do and play the numbers game, you know? Look to see how many people are following them to determine whether or not uh, God's truth is being proclaimed? Well, I don't think we can do that. Even though there are many people who believe that you can determine truth by counting heads, uh, that is, as we know, a logical fallacy because lots of people can be wrong. If we use this as a test of, of who's from the Lord and who isn't from the Lord, we'd have to recognize that our Lord Jesus Christ himself would fail the test. At the end of his three and a half years of ministry, the majority of people he ministered to cried out for his death and there was only a handful of people that were following him. As we look around, we see that, on the other hand, there are churches such, well, so-called churches, such as the Mormon church that boast 15 million members. In 2013, the Roman church, according to the Vatican, had 1.2 billion uh, members. Now, does that mean that they're right because they have so many people and that Jesus is wrong because he had so few? Now, there has to be a better way of determining which is which, and thankfully there is, and our Lord Jesus gives us one this evening. He says, you can tell them apart, you can know them by their fruits. Now, what I'd like to do is consider two things. The first one is why it's difficult to recognize sometimes a false prophet, at least, you know, outwardly. But secondly, how you can tell the true from the false. Now, first of all, let's consider why it is sometimes difficult to recognize a false prophet. I mean, how do people gain the, no well, I can't, I'm not sure if I can use the word notoriety because I guess that has a negative connotation to it, but how do they gain the, um, the popularity that they do even within what seems to be the church? Now, one thing I'd like to do is just back up and consider what a prophet is to begin with because I'm using the word prophet and we need to understand that there's different senses in which you can use that word. Now, originally, <coughs> excuse me, a prophet was given two gifts in particular, two gifts that they would exercise in their ministry. Uh, since the prophet was called by God, 
to prosecute his lawsuit, that is God's lawsuit against his people for their covenant breaking. And again, this, this assumes a little bit of background on this understanding of the covenant as being a legally binding contract between God and his people that uh, when the people of God would break that contract, he would send the prophet out to tell them. Well, in order to do that, he had to be able to do two things. He had to be able to uh, foretell, if I can put it that way, and foretell. In other words, he had to be able to declare God's truth. And he also had to be able, by God's grace, to predict the future. Now, the prophet would declare, when he came to God's people, what God had already said. The prophet would remind Israel of God's faithfulness. He would remind them of his mercies in the past and in the present. He would remind them of what it is that God called them to do on the basis of those mercies, what his commandments were, uh, what God promised to do if they would simply obey those commandments and what he threatened to do if they would disobey. And of course, they would also point out the particular ways in which they did disobey and sinned against the Lord and call them to repentance in order that they might turn from their sins and experience God's blessing. So that was their forth telling. That was their declaring God's will. That is their work as a lawyer, you might say, in this covenant lawsuit that God was prosecuting against his people for their covenant breaking. But the prophet would not just foretell or declare God's word, they would also foretell or predict what God would do in his mercy when they wouldn't repent. And more often than not, they didn't. And what God would do for them after he had chastised them for their sins in his mercy. Uh, when the prophets, of course, exercised this ministry, there was a way that God had told them, uh, the people, that they could distinguish between a true and a false prophet. Basically, there were two different ways. The first was, if what they predicted did not come to pass, then the people would know that that is a false prophet. Let me read what uh, Moses writes. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 22. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So here's the first test of how to know whether or not uh, prophets, at least in the days in which they were foretelling and foretelling, how they could be distinguished, true from the false. If one of them predicted something would take place and it didn't come to pass, the prophet spoke from himself and not from the Lord. And actually, there was a severe penalty for that, uh, which was death. Now, the second was if they predicted that something would come to pass and the Lord actually allowed it to come to pass, and these prophets then told them to go after other gods or, in other words, taught them to do something which the Lord had told them to do otherwise, then they would know he was a false prophet. Again, Moses writes in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5. 
If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear Him, and you shall keep His commandments, listen to His voice, serve Him, and cling to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from among you. You know, if, if a number of these self-styled, self-proclaimed prophets would just simply read these passages, perhaps it would strike fear in their hearts that they wouldn't so presumptuously speak in the name of the Lord. And again, if you don't know it already, there's plenty of them out there. Now again, as I said, this is how it was in the days of Moses, in the times of the Old Testament, and we might even apply this to the New Testament when there were prophets, okay? How can you tell a true from a false? Well, again, if what they uh, predict doesn't come to pass, they're a false prophet. If what they predict comes to pass and they encourage you to go against what God has already said to you, then again, uh, they're a false prophet. Now, our job of telling them apart is really a little bit easier today because we know from Scripture and we know from church history, we know from experience that the Lord no longer gives one of the two gifts that He gave to the prophet, the gift of foretelling the future. God has completed His Word. We have the entirety of, of the revelation that He intends for us to have, and it is enough for us. Uh, we know what it is that God promises if we obey. We know what He threatens if we disobey, and we know what is next on the prophetic horizon. In other words, the purpose of the gift has already been fulfilled, and we no longer need to look for any further revelation from God. Now, what that means is that if anyone anywhere predicts anything, then we can know right away that person is a false prophet because the Lord isn't doing that any longer. He doesn't give that gift. Now, that eliminates or identifies a large number of false prophets simply by itself. But there is that other area. You know, and let's, let's shift a little bit now because I've been using the term prophet uh, to refer to prophets and teachers, but that declarative uh, gift that God gave uh, the prophet is something that is still, you know, it, it's still given today, the, the gift of teaching, the gift of declaring God's will. Now, we still have that gift given, and so we need to be able to understand when it is actually exercised from God or when it is a false teacher versus a, a true teacher from the Lord. Again, let's just define what we mean by this. It's the gift to be able to explain God's Word, to be able to declare God's Word, to be able to apply what God has already said in His Word. Now, there's many who claim to do this today, and we need to be able to distinguish those who are doing God's will from those who are not, the genuine from the false. Now, this is where it can get a little bit difficult because it's hard to tell from the exterior what's going on. They can all basically look pious, and that's why they tend to lead a lot of people after them. Now, Jesus tells us in verse 15 of our text, "'Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing.'" but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Well, how is the false teacher going to present himself or herself, in, in, as you know, the case may go in, in today's world? They're going to come clothed, as it were, in sheep's clothing. Does that mean that we're supposed to expect to see them wearing a, a sheep's fleece? Uh, no, but what he means by this is appearing as somebody who is godly, appearing as somebody who 
is from God, who claims to bring the Word of God, but who's really only putting on an act. Another word for a person like this is a hypocrite. They're pretending to be one thing when they're actually something else. Jesus says they look on the outside good, like the Pharisees, you know, they look like whitewashed whitewash sepulchers. Beautiful on the outside, but inside they're full of corruption. Jesus said the same thing is true regarding the false teacher, the false prophet. Outwardly, they look good. You know, they, they perhaps uh, have that air of authority. Perhaps they have that charisma. Uh, they appear pious. Uh, they appear to be holy. Uh, they appear to know what they're talking about. They may even quote scripture. But what they're actually doing by what they're doing is not honoring God. Instead, they're simply trying to take advantage of you for their own personal gain. You can't tell from the outside. You can't tell from what they look. You can't tell necessarily from their, their demeanor. And that's because we can't see the heart. We can't see what's going on inside. If we could open the door like the sepulcher that Jesus is referring to and look inside, perhaps we could see that corruption. We could see that they're trying to deceive us. But since we can't, how else can we know? How can we know whether or not they have been sent by God? Well, we can only know by their fruits, right? Their fruits. What it is they teach and what their teaching actually produces. In other words, the fruit of their ministry. Jesus goes on to say in verses 16 through 20, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. And so we need to ask basically a couple of questions of any teacher that says that he is teaching God's word. The first question is, are they bearing the fruit of God's truth? In other words, are they teaching the scriptures? Now, Jesus emphasized this morning that his teaching was not his own, but it was the Father's. And again, understand what he meant by that. He wasn't saying that, that he wasn't God, God in human flesh, that this wasn't his word. But basically, he was saying that he came as a servant uh, to declare God's truth as a man. Uh, he was taking the subordinate role. He was honoring his father. He was speaking his truth, the truth which he himself inspired by his spirit in the Old Testament and which was coming down to him, as it were, from his divine nature, communicated not only through the Old Testament scriptures, but also through the spirit of God. That's what Jesus meant when he said in John 7, verse 16, so Jesus answered them and said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. You see, it, it is the teaching of Christ, but on the other hand, what he's pointing out here is that it is coming from the divine nature and not from his human nature. This isn't just the teaching of man. It's not just man's opinion. This is God's word. Now, Jesus teaches us that the one who teaches his own opinions in God's name is doing nothing more than, than seeking to advance his own glory, his own fame, and not God's, which is something he would not do, which is what we saw in verse 18. He continues, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So basically, here is the first test of a false teacher, of a false prophet. I just wish more people would apply it, is what they're saying. Does it agree with what God said? Now, I think you'll recall in the book of Acts, as uh, Paul went around evangelizing, as he went around teaching, he came across a particularly interesting group of people that wouldn't just take Paul's word for it, but they wanted to make sure that what he was saying was actually God's word and what he was saying was true of Scripture actually was true of Scripture by going into the Scripture and examining it for themselves. And I'm talking, of course, about the Bereans. Uh, Luke writes of them in Acts 17, verse 11. 
Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Now I think what, what Luke means here, of course, is that when he was in Thessalonica, they just rejected out of hand everything Paul was saying. They wouldn't even bother to look and see whether it agreed with Scripture or not. They just rejected it. But in this case, they were eager to receive it, but they wanted to make sure that it was scriptural, and so they checked it against Scripture. They were at least willing to do the work to make sure that it was God's truth. Now, if we simply applied this one test to a majority of the so-called prophets, teachers today, uh, that by itself would be enough to expose them. Now, one thing, though, I do want to say that we do need to be careful here because we do recognize there's a lot of people who are teaching the Word of God today who are teaching things that are in error, but they're not necessarily false prophets. And we do need to make, I think, this distinction. Uh, those who are false prophets have an ulterior motive. They are teaching what they know to be contrary to God's Word, or maybe they even add some truth to it to, to make it more plausible. But they're seeking to take advantage of God's people. They want something from them. They want to either enhance their own glory, they want to gain wealth, or whatever it may be. But there are others who may declare God's word and may teach things out of it that, that are simply wrong. But they are not false prophets. They simply misunderstand the scriptures. We do need to take that into account. I mean. I can think of numerous examples. Uh, of course, it would be everywhere that I perceive or that we perceive people differing with us on whatever it may be. Uh, we believe that what we believe comes from Scripture. And we compare what, what they believe and we say, well, this, this isn't scriptural. Um, again, let me just maybe give a couple of examples. What about, um, you know, the idea of, the, of Arminians and Calvinists, you know? Uh, are Arminians false prophets because they're teaching man's absolute free will to choose good or evil even though he comes into this world in a fallen state, hostile against God? Uh, they deny the idea that God must intervene first, that he must send a spirit, that he must change the heart. Uh, would we say they're false prophets because they teach other than what the Bible teaches on that? Well, again, not necessarily. Uh, or those that we've already sort of singled out, the charismatics who believe in the continuance of the gifts? Are they false teachers, false prophets because they believe in the continuance of these gifts? Uh, again, not necessarily. We don't want to conclude that they're unconverted, that they have some evil ulterior motive because they have made mistakes, even if they happen to be large mistakes. Let me just point out something that Jonathan Edwards taught, which certainly is much true today as it was then. As long as they believe the gospel, okay, as long as they're trusting Jesus Christ for their salvation and living a life that is consistent with it, if they believe that what they are teaching comes from the Word of God, they are actually bound to believe it and to teach it, and they really can't do otherwise. Again, as long as it's not something that's heretical that actually destroys the gospel, so if they believe the true gospel and they're living a life that's consistent with it, even though they may believe things to be true in the word of God that really aren't true, they are still true believers and we need to treat them as such. However, Edwards was also quick to point out, if they know the Bible teaches otherwise, if they know it says something other than what they say that it says and they continue to believe that and teach it, or at least not believe it, but teach it, or they teach things that aren't referenced in the Bible at all. If they purposely distort God's word for personal gain, they must be rejected as false teachers, as false prophets and unconverted men. They need to be evangelized. So first of all, we can know that they are true or false prophets by whether or not what they teach lines up with the Word of God with that particular, again, caveat that I've included. But secondly, we need to consider the fruit their ministry is producing. That, that's another big area. Now again, not the numbers. Doesn't have to do with numbers as we've seen. Numbers can be deceiving. 
but the fruit that it bears in those who sit under it. Um, we need to ask this question. Is their ministry producing in, in their hearers what the truth of God should produce? Is it producing sound believers, solid believers, those who believe the truth of the gospel, those who love God and are seeking to honor Him, those who love the brethren, you know, whether, you know, and they're seeking to serve them, whether in their particular church and denomination or, I mean, really in loving Christians across the board. Is it producing those who are loving their neighbor and reaching out to them with the gospel? Is their teaching producing uh, Christians who are studying God's truth and applying it to their lives and who are growing in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because this is the fruit that God's truth is actually going to bear through the power of the Holy Spirit. We might even say that, that this is the way the Spirit of God vindicates the truth of God in that He causes it to produce that kind of fruit in the lives of those who are genuinely the Lord's. This is the seal that He sets, as it were, to this work. So what kind of fruit is it producing? Is it producing this kind of fruit, sound, solid conversions, godliness, holiness, Christ-likeness? Or on the other hand, is it producing what we see in in many ministries today, self-centered, self-seeking, unprincipled, worldly people who want to be rich in the things of this world but really don't care about being rich in the things of God, who don't care about personal holiness or growth, uh, I should say personal growth, and the growth of God's kingdom. What kind of fruit is it producing? Now again, here's another caveat. Uh, we do need to understand that sometimes no matter you know, how good the teaching might be, it can still result you know, in this negative kind of fruit, can't it? But it has to be in spite of the ministry and not because of the ministry. So what I'm saying is the fruit that false teachers produce can be this very negative fruit, but the reason why it produces that fruit is because that's what it leads people to. It leads them to be self-centered and worldly and seek for fame and fortune and all these different things. God wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to have this overcoming, victorious kind of life. And they, they go on and on about this and people think, yes, you know, God exists for me. He's a servant to me and it's all about me. And so they continue to listen to this because it panders after their flesh, the very thing that the Lord tells us we need to put to death if we are to enter into his kingdom. So again, does their teaching agree with the word of God and is it bearing good fruit? What we should be seeking after is a soundly biblical ministry where the word of God is, is taught and where we see these fruits being produced in our lives, understanding at the same time that we are also responsible for you know, how much we're going to benefit from the word if we turn a deaf ear to everything that's being said, the teaching isn't going to do us any good. But if we are listening, if it is sound biblical teaching, these are the kinds of fruits that it should produce in us. So again, understanding God has given to us a teacher from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has spoken in his word. And we need to embrace that truth. We need to uh, understand it, we need to apply it, and at the same time, we need to make sure that we avoid those who would lead us astray from that truth. We do not want to give this up because this is really all that matters, what Jesus said. Not what we think, not what others think. What matters is what Jesus said. So let's, by God's grace, be able to recognize, again, things that are false when we hear them, and the only way you can do that is by knowing this. When you hear God's word, be in those places where you can hear it. Compare it with Scripture. See if this isn't, in fact, what the Lord is saying. When you see that it is, embrace it. Fortify yourself with it so that you don't be led astray, as many people are. I'll just remind you, that movie we saw last night, a lot of these atheists that were teaching 
in these universities evolution, many of them said, I used to be a Christian. I was raised in a Christian home. I thought I was a Christian, but then I learned about evolution and I saw that this was really true, this was really elegant, this is really the way it is, and they just totally gave up their Christianity. They were led astray by somebody who wasn't even in the church. But they are still false prophets declaring the, the faith of evolution. And they were led astray because they were not grounded in God's truth. Many of those that, um, if you talk to people who are Jehovah's Witnesses, who are anti-Trinitarians, they used to be Trinitarians. They used to believe in the Trinity, but then someone came along, a Jehovah's Witness, and convinced them that Jesus wasn't God, that only the Father is God, that the Spirit of God is simply an impersonal force that God sends to accomplish His will. And they deny the Trinity. It's because they weren't grounded in the truth, and we say ultimately they weren't converted to begin with if they stick in that. So embrace the truth, learn the truth, get grounded in the truth, the truth that the Father sent His Son into the world to give to you, and recognize then lies when you hear them and reject them and do not go after them. This is the only safe way to live in this world. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard to our, our lives.